Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel in the flight briefing room. This video is all about an interview that I took part in. I say part in, I actually hijacked his podcast to introduce him as the host. because The Everything Aviation podcast is great. If you like podcasts, I'll leave a link to this in the description and hopefully it should be playing a little bit of the front screen now of, of all the interviews from Mike Ling to Spitfire pilots to Irish astronauts. There's a whole raft of people on there and really interesting stories behind all these people. I've been listening to his podcast for a while and I wanted to actually find out more about Mikey for those that have actually been listening to his podcast. So that's what this interview is all about. So let's jump straight into it and join Mikey and myself as I gave him, give him a little bit of a grilling for his podcast. Brilliant. Right. Well, we'll go for version two, shall we, Mikey? Now I've actually remembered to put my microphone up. <laughs> so, uh, so for those that are new here, welcome to the flight briefing room. Uh, actually, no, this is me hijacking Mikey's channel for the day, uh, the Everything Aviation podcast, because I thought it'd be a really good idea after Mike interrogates, is that probably a polite way of saying it, any, uh, any person that comes on his, uh, on his podcast. Actually, who is Mikey? What's he all about? I'm sure he's got a good few stories under his belt. A good crack, apparently it's the term, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm learning the Irish lingo on this one. Apparently, when he sent me messages, mate, what does that mean? Oh, I, I forget your English. You don't understand this stuff. Um, so please, introduce yourself. And I've put my hand up to this one. How do you pronounce your surname? <laughs> so I do forget wait, wait, you Brits. It's very funny that my surname is, is unpronounceable. Uh, I'll accept McMahon, but it is pronounced McMahon. Um, I myself have had a pilot license for coming. It'd be nine years this year. Um, wow, your baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, it, it, I've, I've been brought up around aviation um, and I've had a privilege of flying some very, very cool aircraft, some just from the right seat. Uh, but I also have a lot of very cool stuff on the left seat in the logbook as well. Or, or as your recent videos have shown, the rear seat. <laughs> the, the rear seat. We'll come on to yeah. that. We'll come on to that <laughs> later on. You've, you've mentioned about your father and other bits and pieces uh, before we started this chat and other things. I'm, I'm assuming he's been a fairly big influence on you getting into aviation. Would, would you say that's true? Yeah, massively. So my dad, um, he was the chief instructor of the Irish Parachute Club for a good few years. Um, but he was, he's been parachuting since he was younger than me. Um, so I, br I was brought up on the Irish Parachute Club. Um, my dad, watching my dad progress through, he then became a tandem master. Uh, he became a jump master. He became a static line coach. Um, he was also a, a free fall coach as well and then became um, chief, chief instructor uh, of the Irish Parachute Club for a number of years as well. Um, but he also, he decided that... Um, like skydiving is, is you just fall with style there's no actual kind of flying um <laughs> whereas he was like well i want to fly and he came across flex wing micro lights and then um he did that that was 1999 i think it was and he ended up at the age of five my, me at the age of five ended up getting strapped into the back of this xl uh flex wing micro -Lite Mighty xl and doing my first flight at the age of five in, in an xl wow wow so leading on from that, and I think your father may have had some influence in this, you are actually TV famous, really, aren't you? From a very young age. Yeah, from a very young um, age. So, so it's the, um, the real magnificent men and their flying machines. How on earth did that come about? So that was, it was really strange. The dad rang me up one day and he said he was after being contacted by a few um, people uh, from Walker George Films on behalf of the BBC who were going to film a documentary about the Royal Britain Microlight Rally in 2011. Um, and he, they asked for characters, basically, around the, they asked the BMAA for characters and, and who would be good at it. And my dad's name kept coming up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so eventually they caved and were like, right, OK, um, we'll give him a buzz. And they gave me a buzz. And uh, I was quite surprised. He, 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 I thought he was just telling me, like, oh, dad's going to be on the telly. And then he was like, well, do you want to come? Because he always said he'd never bring me across the sea because from Wexford to, to Wales is 72 miles of water and it's a lot of water. I said he'd never bring me, never bring me across. Isn't it wet in Ireland and wet in Wales and wet in between? Yeah, basically. It's basically just flying over the sea all the time and every so often you get little tufts of grass. <laughs> in the middle of the sea is a bit worrying. How did that get there? <laughs> the thing is, you can't tell where the sea is. <laughs> 
Well, but I, for those that haven't seen this documentary, I'm sure Mikey, when he finally gets to edit out all the bad bits, he doesn't want me to ask questions on. And for those that don't know, Rob, his best friend, is in the back of his room right now, and Rob <laughs> has given me some questions already. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Uh, that's it. It's amazing how quickly you can lose best mates. Yeah. How to make friends and influence, Rob? Perfect, mate. Perfect. Anyway. <laughs> So clearly this, this uh, the TV documentary, as we both know from video editing, you can edit anything in the way you want it to. Yeah, so, 100%. But they made you out to be a real kind of scaredy cat. But actually, you had already been flying at that time, hadn't you? I had, yeah, yeah. So they made me out to be a real scaredy cat. So there was, there was bits where I've, I've never done a tour. I've, I've never flown outside of the Isle of Ireland. Um, and this was a big thing for me and experiencing kind of weather I, I hadn't seen and we're, we're kind of flying, flying around and flying through showers and stuff. And it, you know what? There was only like four or five bits that I was genuinely like, oh, I'm not too sure about this. But they played on that. And the, some of the footage they used, actually. So they sent the cameras off before we even started the rally. Um, we Because we, myself and my dad, we had to fly um, from Ireland to, to the UK. So we had to do 72 miles of Irish Sea with mm. 40 minutes out of sight of land uh, on either side. Um, wow, and the statistics and all like that. It, it was quite that was that was kind of one of the first things that I was a little bit scared about because with the statistics and all that, with the temperature of the water at that time of year and everything, um, yeah. if we had it gone down by the time the helicopter got to us, they would have just been picking up two dead bodies out of water. Yeah, um, and that was that's kind of a thing that that's that I I got what nearly two hundred hours flying now, and it's still a thing that that sits in my mind when I'm doing sea crossings and stuff like that. It mm. it, it, it doesn't go away, but they, I they avoid made water on... at all costs when I can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even even going out to the Isle of Wight, I cross that as a sea crossing. <laughs> yeah, you can um, go by the little spur bit, can't you? I think if I ever do it, I'll do it by the spur and yeah, hop across. Exactly, yeah. and and it's, it's since since then, like I've I've done. I've done the other way quite a few times, but I've also crossed the English Channel into France with a Sky Ranger as well and brought that down to the south of France. Um, mm. So we've done them crossings as well. But all this was filmed before we actually got to the rally. But they kind of played on that and used that footage to make it look like it was part of the, the rally, to make it look like I was scared all the time. Mm. Was your mum generally as scared as she was? I she think had tears so. in her eyes. I was, I was <laughs> like, I'm the... I'm, I'm the, I'm the, the kind of cherished one in the family, as to say. So I think she, she kind of was... Yeah, fair enough. That 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 was genuine as it was. So, yeah, that was. Um, so there's two points I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of bring in now from from what you've touched on there. Parachuting. <laughs> most yeah. p- most pilots. Why would you jump out of a perfectly serviceable aeroplane, especially if you're learning to fly? How did parachuting come into this? Um, because I've done one jump, and I can guarantee I'm never doing it again. So it, I'm it, happy I've done it, but you yeah. just kept on going back for more, didn't you? Well, I'm I'm on the I'm on the bit now where it, I'd probably never do it again. Um, so I was brought up in the Irish Parachute Club and age 12 <laughs> <laughs> all over my face <laughs> um, age 12 strapped to my dad 13 and a half thousand feet back of a Pilatus Porter door slides open so the whole side of this airplane is opened and I'm Ooh. looking at this 13,000 foot abyss and it's your bo- the body is a very strange thing I remember sitting in the door and I remember my dad giving me thumbs up um, to say it's okay to put my arms out. But I don't remember. Were you tandem at this point? I was tandem, yeah, yeah. yeah and I yeah. don't remember leaving the aircraft. I, but I, I, apparently I kicked for a good 1,500 feet. And I have no recollection of that either. And we were we were going <laughs> up on our sides and everything. I have no recollection of this <laughs> whatsoever. So then we, we landed. I perforated an eardrum. Uh, that was all fun and games. Oh, blimey. Um, that 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 was it was it was great and gave such an adrenaline rush and it, it just kind of led in from there because I, I was spending all my time at the Irish Parachute Club and growing up and I ended up being their their gear manager so hiring out uh, kit and all that for uh, for students and and making sure it's all come back in and everything and but then also been their their ground manager as well which is kind of where I think more the aviation side of it came in um, for flying because I was playing yeah. with this Pilatus Porter and flying in this Pilatus Porter all the time. And it was just got to a stage where I was getting more of a buzz as a thought of being in the aircraft than being out of it. But to this yeah. day, I still go and do indoor skydiving and everything like that in the wind tunnels because it's, it's just, it, it is addictive and it feels exactly yeah. like the real thing. That, that, it's just madness. I say we, we carry them. I flew with parachutes and gliders, but it, it doesn't normally trans that most people that learn to fly they can start jumping out of them whereas actually you've done it the other way around haven't you really well exactly before i even started doing lessons and all that i jumped out of an airplane um mm. and same with my dad my dad had jumped out before he, he thought he always wanted to be a pilot but he went to skydiver roof first 
Um, yeah. And it, it's kind of a strange dynamic. And also it's, it's funny as well that like myself and my dad, uh, I mo- more recently than, than that, but my dad uh, is terrified of heights. Um, and same, same as myself. Uh, but <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, he, he's got no problem going to 20 odd thousand feet and jumping out of an airplane. Uh, mm. Whereas you try and get him to go up and clean the snow off the TV aerial so we can watch something on the telly. It's a big no, no. So it, I can relate to that. I can relate yeah, to that. It's, it's a strange. I got a balcony here that I can just about stand on, but uh, I nearly <laughs> my knees gave way at the top of the Empire State Building with my other half. Wow. The the, the, there's an in joke between Mikey and myself that he won't fly that high. Yeah, he'll quite happily jump out of an aeroplane. <laughs> like two and a half thousand feet, you peaked, mate, aren't you? It's like I don't go That's any it, higher. Two and a half, half. any higher than that, I start getting the nosebleed. You've also said about the the fact that you were learning to fly as well at this at this time. So so how did you go about? getting your MPPL you did it at a very young age didn't you You started at 15 you soloed at 16 and then had your MPPL by 17 I think yeah 17th birthday that's that's a pretty good stint you know to to be able to do it that quickly as well how did that happen what what was your other than influences from family that clearly flew um so my it's it's a very and was it three axis or was it flex wing at the time it was three axis and I'll tell you how that came about um my dad was a flex wing pilot. He's a, he's does both now. Um, he, he's he's a great fella. He's a senior inspector for the BMAA. Uh, he's a Czech pilot for the I, uh, for the uh, NMAI and the BMAA. And he was uh, chairman of the uh, um, National Micro Association of Ireland for a good while as well. It always looked like it was going to go flex wing, and I enjoyed flying in the back of the flex wing. But that documentary, you'll see bits where I'm saying I'm I'm cold, and I, in fairness, I I was freezing. Um, the day <laughs> it was coming up to my fifteenth birthday. He was asking me what I want. What he was going to get me a flying lesson, um, but he wasn't sure whether I wanted to go flex wing or tree axis. So the day we went flying, and he asked me, there was snow on the ground. Um, I was <laughs> I was rattling in the back. I was shivering like anything. And he said to me, "What do you what do you want to fly with? Thought about it, tree axis or flex wing?" And I thought, "Well, I can't be flying in these conditions like this." So I, was, I want something with cabin heat. So straight away I went tree axis, um, and that's how that was born. And I ended up with Rayfield O'Carroll up in Carnan Aviation in, in County Armagh. Which, which was a fantastic school. And at the time, I described their field like an aircraft carrier. What a place to... There's a lot of people in Ireland that have really short farm strips and they wouldn't be comfortable with you coming in. But as soon as you said you learned at Kernan Aviation, Rayfield O'Carroll's, they just put the phone and said, yeah, you're grand. Because this thing was 350 metres with just under 300 usable. Uh, you're coming in over high tension power lines um, and then right. dropping into a valley and having to fly up a hill to land. One way in, one way out, no room for error. So it really, yeah. really honed your skills in. And doing that at the age of, of 15 really just blew my mind. Um, mm. that, that was just amazing to do um, short so that, flying is is great isn't it the fact you can get in and out of places where bigger aircraft just can't do that exactly it. like you try and take a Cessna 172 or anything like that into there it was never going to happen um, and it was great because going back to saying the, the influence of family members and everything when I showed my granddad this uh, where I was finding on my granddad's ex Royal Air Force and ex Air Canada and um, he, wow. he was on Queen's flight for a good few years um, and, and then he, he went on to another, I can't remember what flight he was on after was that. It, was it 32 Squadron then? Was it still 32 Squadron? I'm not 100% sure. I t- it was yeah. that long ago. They were still flying the Wessex. Um, Blimey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a Heron, I think he mentioned as well. But, wow. Yeah, that is old school. Yeah, he was 60. He was in. I think it was 60 to 69. He was on Queen's Fly Far. Um, yeah. And then he went on to, to Air Canada after that. But showing him where I landed into the into here and just seeing him light up and be like really is like yeah yeah and describing it as like an aircraft carrier trying to get on and off it, it was just that short and then and like that <laughs> it was it was great and that, that was another big influence really was was when I said it because you know you start and it seems like a mountain you have to climb and do I keep going that mountain do I not and having the support from my dad and my granddad and seeing my granddad's face light up every time you mentioned it um was absolutely amazing as well um, so that kind of that, that went on and then at that stage I had I went solo uh, 12 and a half hours so when it came up to that documentary being filmed where it looked like I was scared all the time I had 10 and a half hours at that stage um, yeah. under my belt in a C-42 getting ready to go solo and I'd yeah. done engine failures I'd done stalls I'd done unusual dangerous attitudes it was just building up the time now getting ready to go and waiting for a cam day yeah. to do it and I was juggling all that as well with school. I was still in school and I was doing my um, junior search at the time, which would be the equivalent of the GCSEs in the UK. Um, so I was trying, I was also studying for the 
the exams for pilot exams, but also studying for, for life exams. It's the same in school. Um, mm. So that, that kind of took up a lot of time and trying to balance that and everything like was, was quite hard. I'm not the most academic person. So when it came to like school stuff or flying stuff, I was more kind of, I put all my best into the school stuff, but not really. My brain never was satisfied. It was always satisfied when I was reading about air law and everything like that, rather than reading about, what the birth rate of sudan is <laughs> <laughs> i can i can relate to that school work sucked but flying flying study was great you know yeah exactly those, those, yeah. e5b <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i don't care about your equations i want me e5b give me more maths problems on this thing <laughs> yeah. yeah so in school i couldn't solve a maths problem for anything but give me one give me trying cal- trying to calculate a time over over a certain point i have it done in a minute yeah is that wind up or wind down method <laughs> <laughs> So where did you take your flying after that? I mean, clearly from, from where you were then to where you are now, there's been a bit of a gap and you've carried on flying. Yeah. Where did, so you learned in Ireland, but learned clearly you're Ireland. not in Ireland now. You're, le- you're flying on the South Coast, aren't you? Yeah. So what, I'm, I'm What's in happened in that time period in your life? Have you just sustained the microlite flying? Licensed for microlite. I'm getting there with an A320, uh, hopefully with an instructor's tick on the end of it as well. Um, is that for full size, as in, or is that simulator? I know you've got that, a video of you on the simulator. That that's going to be for the sim instructor. Okay. Um, which I'm happy, which I'm happy with, because uh, isn't, isn't that just a big computer game, really? Isn't it? Just, just a, yes, Flight Simulator X. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even the pilot, really. <laughs> Flip the <egg. laughs> So you've been working towards that qualifications, but there, there must have been something in that time period that was. I mean, for me, uh, it was any job I had was a means of getting airtime. So to maintain your license, there must have been some jobs in that time period from when you've left school to now that has allowed you to fund your aviation passion. Yeah, so I um, I, I did a very, very short stint uh, with the military. Um, that was great crack, but it, it wasn't meant to be. Um, and then after that, uh, I went with a well-known airline in Ireland um who were, were great fun um and and to, to work but i just it got to a stage where i just wanted to fly for a living and i didn't mind what i did so i went as crew with this well-known airline in in ireland and that was that was great fun um do, doing all that and then kind of from there uh just just kept up with the micro life flying and flew some amazing things and like i said with the parachute club we were flying in the pilatus porter and everything like that and got to fly right seat in a sky van got to fly in a dornier da28 i think it was sky master or sky <laughs> wow that's turbo um, prop isn't it yeah twin turbo prop it gets to fourteen and a half thousand feet in something like eight minutes there was always that and then we we acquired um i think before uh before, uh, before joining um the military and 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 uh and then kind of went from there, we, we, we joined this airline, um, but we're flying AX, a little two-stroke AX3 at the time uh, when all this was, was going on as well. Uh, so that was... That it was seems great. to be a big following for the AX3. Yeah. I, it, I, does ev- it does everything at 50 miles an hour. It climbs at 50, descends at 50, and cruises at 50. And you, I've, I've tried to get it faster. And I climbed up, and it took me ages to do this one day, but I climbed up to about two and a half thousand feet, put the nose down <laughs> and left the power on. And I think I just managed to scrape 62 miles an hour out of it. I don't want to tell you what my PB does. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> it's all about you. It's all about you. So clearly you've, um, you've got an exuberant style of flying. And this is leading on to the next bunch of questions. I know we've chatted about this on phone conversations as well. So there is an element of competition in your life. Because yeah. I've seen the trophies. And I think they're on your Instagram. And I'm sure you'll put a link to your Instagram out on here. So all the, I'm not sure which order these are going to come in, but they're from someone you do know, Edwin L. <laughs> and the next phrase is pylon racing. Yes. yes. So please elaborate on microlites and pylon racing. You normally have visions of beefed up P-51 Mustangs or jet aircraft whizzing around Nevada and this and the other, but microlites and pylon racing I'm trying to compute that at the minute. So go on. So the, the first time I ever did this, uh, so my first competition, I was very lucky to be invited to compete with the English team, uh, English national team in 2015 um, against the French in a Franglais friendly. And uh, the French came over. We were at Overfarm in Gloucester. Uh, French came over and we, we 
just did competition. So I was with Paul Dewhurst at the time, who, who's head of Flylight and owns Flylight and does all the Sky Ranger stuff. And we flew down to Lambeter. Um, and the whole thing was, was to spot pictures on the way down. Nice long runway we were going to do pylon racing. So you might have seen, uh, it was on BBC News a couple of years ago at the World Air Games. Um, Paul and some of the other lads had actually come first place in the, in, in this thing. And um, they took off out of Dubai and flew around uh, these pylons. So it was one of these... Um, tasks that we did and I, i'd never done anything like this before this was kind of the first first thing i'd done and i was still kind of 2015 still kind of how old were you at this time i was uh 2015 i'd come up on i was 18 <laughs> and <point>. competing <laughs> competing yeah <laughs> and i wasn't even the youngest uh which which was hilarious but we we got on got down to land better and we said we're going to do this we all lined up it's a great picture actually of all of us lined up um standing there waiting to go and the whole thing was was to take off you had pile on this end and it was, it was more like a speed circuit than the pile on racing so you would take off dump the flaps uh stay low and and then try and get round this this circuit as, as quick as you could and the first time i i did i did it with paul and then stop in a certain time or in, in a box and first time i did it with paul and i was like this this is amazing this is proper red bull air race and stuff which it wasn't <laughs> really that, that's let's be honest they're in a league of their own um so, so we did that and I was like, this is, this is amazing. And then uh, fast forward then to 2018, uh, myself and Ed, we took uh, his competition Sky Ranger down to uh, the south of France to a place called mm. Benedettes. And we competed down there for a week and we did another one down there. And that, that's actually on my YouTube channel. You can check that out. And that was, that was amazing. That was, yeah. Was that, that fairly low level to say the least? Um, if I remember it correctly... Remember, mind it's in French airspace, so we're all good. Um, it was <laughs> 66 feet on the altimeter. <laughs> <laughs> all legal pylon racing in a microlight in France. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so the other the other um, element was from your good friend Paul Dewhurst. Uh, who obviously clean as your father very well. Uh, was more about the Franglais, and I'm sure there's many stories you can't tell but is there any amusing ones that you can tell about your uh, your time with paul on the front glaze because that was later on wasn't it <laughs> yeah so so um do you know it, it was just it was it was amazing to have to, to learn from someone um it was sat, sat beside me in, in that kind of it's almost it's almost like if you were sitting beside god that's who was sat beside me. Um, Don't tell Paul he's gone. Come on. <laughs> and the funny thing was, is Paul was letting me fly as well. So that kind of blew my mind. And one of the best ones we had was we were coming down. We hadn't even got, we were transiting from Sywell to the Isle of Wight. And HMS Queen Elizabeth was in port. And we were coming down Portsmouth. Um, so we come straight down over Portsmouth Harbour in, in the clear bit. Uh, and then straight out to the Isle of Wight, coasting a, coasting a ride. And then in that way. And, uh, the two of us, I don't, I don't even know what it was looking. I was sat in the left seat, kind of looking and cruising, looking down at this aircraft carrier. Uh, and Paul kind of looked at me and grinned. And he went, if the ticker at the front of this was to stop now, where would you go? And I looked down and went, uh, onto the carrier hall. And he said, yeah, I don't think there's an aviator who wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that is so atypical, Paul, isn't it? He's a man by the book when it suits. When it suits. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Kick me later, mate. Kick me later. <laughs> but I had to ask those questions. They came out. Uh, the, the the following on questions that I've got, and this is maybe where Rob might want to leave the room. <laughs> Isle of Wight. I'm adding two words. Spit roast. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um... That was that's more Rob uh, and, and, than the, and the the clarification point here for those that are listening while Mike's reco- regaining himself is where did you put the other half of the chicken? <laughs> Go on, tell us a story. So uh, the spit roast started where uh, myself and Rob had just done a beautiful evening of flying. It was time the last year, thirty degrees. We climbed up to two thousand feet. It was still twenty nine degrees up there. It was. You still was... unbroken that two and a half thousand feet barrier, have you? <laughs> no, definitely not. Well, I we'll, we'll get on to that. I, d- I did at one stage, and I'll get on in something a bit quicker and something that used to carry weapons. But we'll come on to that. So <laughs> we've landed, and we're having the, we're we're sat in my 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 club flight sport aviation, uh, and we had landed. Uh, one of the instructors had landed and one of the other renters had landed. So 
I don't know who had it, but these beers just appeared and the sun was setting. We just had a fantastic time of flying. We sat there outside. There wasn't a breath of wind. Sun was going down. Air was still sipping beer. How it doesn't get much better than that. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we were chatting about where do we want to go and next. So I looked at Rob and was like, oh, yeah, you know, like Isla White could be good. And Rob out of nowhere went, yeah, I'd love to go to the Isle of Wight for a spit roast. And the other renter who was with us spat his beer out across the table because Rob made a... And to this day, we have not let him forget it. And it was one of the funniest things ever. So anyway, fast forward to September when Spamfield was on. Myself and Rob get into a C-42. Another one of our club members who flies with us, Martin, he comes with us. We're flying down. Nick from our club is with us as well. We've all got there. Rob's decided to be different. We've all gone hot dogs. Rob wants half a chicken. So Rob, Rob gets his chicken, eats all the bits first. And all of a sudden, we have seen these CBs kicking off all around to, to the south. And we kind of want to go to the to the uh, west, or east uh, and north. So we were like, right, we're not kind of liking this. Should we Let's go. So we abandoned our plans to fly around the needles and all that as well. Jumped in the aircraft, took off. And halfway across the Solent, I said to Rob, oh, I'm really sorry you had to uh, you had to throw away your chicken. To which Rob produces this half chicken from underneath the seat in the C-42. I went, no, nah, you're all right. I've still got it. Showed it to me and put it back under. <laughs> Rob, style and panache. Style and panache. That's how you do it. He's like Joey out of Friends, isn't he? Joey doesn't share food. <laughs> it's it's kind of like that. You try and take any of Rob's food, you're losing an arm. <laughs> people have died for less fair enough um and uh and apparently you you've had a a quick reaction alert interception <laughs> on final approach at headcorn airfield oh god now now i know that you do vlog a lot of your flights so again those that have not realized that mikey does have a youtube channel it is growing and he's learning the art of sound. Now, at this time, I don't think you had sound on your cameras, did you? Well, I did have sound and it got the takeoff, um, but failed kind of somewhere in the middle, which I'm kind of glad of because <laughs> I'd have probably been locked up for some of the um, some of the colourful language that was used in this. But um, So what actually happened? So we've, we've kind of, we, we've come over headcorn. We joined at the numbers down the far end. We've took, taken up a downwind. We're the only one in the circuit. We're doing all our calls. Head corner, we're the only ones head corner are speaking to at this moment of time. Um, it was quite cool. Not a gauge was moving in the cockpit. We we're on the downwind, the spitfires underneath us. Um, life is good anyway. Coming round to left base, uh, usually on base, people you know fly the C 42, you throttle back, lift the nose up slightly, get it slowed into the white arc. First stage of flap, carry on. Um, as I've come around the corner, we've, we've done a good look out first. There's still nothing around. As I've come around the corner, I've gone to lift the nose, lift the nose, bled the speed off, got it in the wire. I've lifted up for the flaps. And as I've gone up for the flaps, this Cessna 152 has descended right down in front of us. And I mean, it was close. The, the GoPro being a wide angle lens didn't do it any justice. We had to they always look them. further away than they actually are. Yeah, exactly. And this was this was close to the point where Rob went... Rob didn't even have time to say anything. Uh, I just had to throw away the flaps. Uh, I did this massive turn and pointed the nose down in this right-hand turn. because eyes, eyes on stalks at this point. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, this massive turn to get out of the circuit to come back in. Um, while I was, me and Rob were, were both shouting obscenities at this Cessna 152 who didn't call anything just to send us straight down into... Clearly they can hear you from the other aircraft. <laughs> oh, it was, oh I, I wish they could. Um, yeah. So to get my own little back, I thought I won't say any of these obscenities on the radio. And uh, So we re-established for finals. And as I re-establish, I just said uh, we were in Victor Romeo that day. I said Gulf Victor Romeo was re-established finals. We were cut off by a Cessna 152. Now at this stage, he's still on the runway. So he doesn't vacate the runway. So I'm thinking of doing a go around at this this stage. Mm. Um, until eventually he, he gets off. Uh, because... I, it, it's probably not like uh, great to admit, but because of that, um, it's such a shock and all that, my, my flare, there wasn't really a flare on the landing. So it was kind of a, yeah. to the point where Rob asked me, was I going to flare anytime soon? And by the time I did, um, we bounced. It's too about, late. Yeah, we bounced about 15 feet and started flying normally in the air again. Um, mm. oh, so we landed, landed that. And then the pilot, like two times and a half, he came up to us and was like, oh, that was me. You know, I was like, well, 
have you not got windows in your 152 to look out of or any radio to be chatting away to? Um, so that was kind of that. That was the, the closest call I think I've ever had with with someone. But I, I think by the time myself and Rob were finished with him, he he kind of got an idea of how in the wrong he was. <laughs> Do you reckon someone in the cockpit said, hold my beer, watch this? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we, you we... alluded earlier to, um, again, those are, those are, so there's, there's a lot of banter between Mikey and myself about flying high because of, of stuff I've done. But again, this is about Mikey tonight. Uh, you alluded about something that you'd flown in a lot faster and a lot higher. Yeah, so we. What? What? Come on! There's, there's got to be. An, you are a man of many stories, so just come on. What? What happened here? What it's... took you above the the two and a half thousand feet and seventy knots? So people, especially around the war, would remember this one. Uh, it was a T six Harvard, um, and for those listening, a T six Harvard is the last aircraft that Battle of Britain pilots or any kind of RAF pilot in the war would have gone on before being handed the keys to a, a Spitfire or a Hurricane. Um, and again, myself and Rob um, decided that we would go and have a spin in this war, war bird, as I say. There's um, a trend here between you and Rob and good ideas. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure who's, who's worse for starting them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, even, even that headcorn trip, actually, that was born out of on the way back from the Isle of Wight trip uh, when we said we mm. should go and get some breakfast in the headcorn. That was the very next day. So that's what we did. So if we had died that day, who to blame? I don't know. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stop being so morbid. Come on. Anyway, <laughs> fast and high, fast um, and high. So, yeah, we, we, we got the opportunity, which is fantastic, to fly in the Wacky Wabbit um, the Harvard T6. Um, and that I, I think, I'm pretty sure that actual aircraft has, has seen combat down in Africa. And we got a chance to fly in this aircraft. Uh, so we went up to Peterborough, Connington, about three weeks ago now. And... Got, got to fly in this and uh, he, he set me up. He got me to 2000 feet and he said, okay, you, you have, you have control. Um, I, I took control of it and it's so light and on, on, on to touch, but it's so fast and everything that like even the slightest turn, you start pulling a bit of G. Um, and I think I've accidentally in it done plus four minus two, uh, by just <laughs> trying to correct things. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a big tub, isn't it? Was it two and a half tons? Two, two and a half tons. So when, when he said to me, before he gave me control, a uh, pilot was asking what I usually fly. And I was, ah, oh, Icarus C-42 microbytes. He's like, what weight are we talking about? It was like 450 kg all up. And he started laughing and he was like, well, this is a two and a half ton tank. And on that note, you have control. And I'm like, oh, I have control. So when I took the control of this aircraft, I thought it was going to be really heavy. And it makes the C-42 look heavy. The controls were really light. You're flying it with two fingers. But because it's so sensitive and everything like that, and because it's so fast, you're doing 250 miles an hour in this thing. And uh, because it was so fast, I didn't realize I was climbing. So when I actually did look at the altimeter on my way back to Connington, I was realised we're going to have to do a hell of a descent because we're up at three and a half thousand feet, nearly four thousand feet here, and that's the highest I'd been in quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> Without jumping out of something. Yeah, or we're going to work. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Yeah, I can't. Im- you, you always get this impression of films that they're really heavy on the controls, but you said it's really light, almost finger and thumb type glider style. Is probably the, the only way I could akin it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, so I first grabbed it. Um, with full full fist and ready to ready to wrestle, and there there was no wrestling. As soon as I took control, she dropped her left wing because it was my right hand to took the control and pushed it too much that way. And I was like, oh okay. So I had to correct that, which was grand. Um, yeah, but that's that's that was the first two minutes was was bouncing around the place trying to get a feel of this. And it was very funny. Glenn, our pilot, was like, oh, the nose has to be on the horizon. I'm so far back in the back of this thing, I can't see the nose. So I'm kind of just look trying to look at the. Uh, the um, speed indicator and, and, and the climb indicator to see what, what we were hitting this to try yeah. and get straight and level. But um, throwing it around the place was, was great fun. And you didn't have to try hard to get up near 4G. And it. It, was, it was amazing. Yeah. To, yeah. You, you, when you climb into this aircraft, you can tell it wasn't built for leisure. It was built for war. Um, yeah. it, but it was such an amazing and capable aircraft. We were right on the wind limits that day as well for crosswind. And it just took it in its stride and take my hat off to Glenn as well. The pilot, he, he knew what she could do and he knew his capabilities. And we, we were, there was no doubt in my mind. Um, but we did this. I mean, the, the grin on your video was just, it was just, a, you couldn't wipe that grin off your face for days, I reckon. Six, 600 horsepower starting up in front of me in a radial engine. I, I, that was, it was amazing. And then the smell filled the cockpit. And I was like, 
this is this is this is what I've dreamt about. This is what boyhood dreams are made of. It's flying in these fires. You read Jeffrey Wellham's first light book. You, you yeah. any of them? These are the aircraft that they're writing about and they're talking about and having fun in. And I'm I'm mm. sat in one that that possibly he himself could have sat in one. In, in, yeah. in this aircraft and i'm sat in this aircraft experiencing what what he's experienced this what, what you're saying now sounds very similar to your interview with sam sam with delise where he was talking about that feeling and having you know jeffrey wellham's book in his pocket well that's it sam sam has become a great friend of mine um well i count him as a great friend uh, through through this podcast um and and through that and, and sam described it as sam sold out a spitfire and he, he's always carried a copy of Jeffrey Wellham's First Light in, in his pocket. And it was from reading that book that he's always wanted to to go and fly the Spitfire. And, and I, I don't think there's many people on this planet um, who would say no. Apart from my mother, mm. I did ask her the other day and she said if she was offered a flight in a, in a Spitfire, she would say no. Um, but really? <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, she's weird. She is. Um, so, but there's not many people. And then to hear Sam talking about it with such passion and seeing that, Jeffrey Wellham's book in his pocket when, when he's flying this, he's, he's doing a victory roll in solo in a Spitfire while tapping his, his, his leg pocket with, with the book in it. And I was like, that, that's yeah. so cool. That, that was a great, a great podcast you did there. And it's it really brought out the passion behind it. And, exactly. and that's what I'm getting now from, from this, just this chat with you is just, you've lived, breathed, fallen through aviation for, for most of your life. And, and it's very hard to get those feelings and passions out. You know, tell any pilot you can't fly it is pretty much like chopping a leg or an arm off. Exactly. Um, you know, even, even I've tried stopping flying for a bit through, through personal reasons. And it was like, can't do it. I've got to go back and do it more. And that's it. So, See, I, I took a two year break um, while I was training for, for a career and then money and stuff like that. And trying to find my feet a bit. And even then it just always felt like there was something missing. So when I was offered the opportunity to, to revalidate my, my MPBL, I was like, yeah, hundred percent. Let's, let's go and do it. Mm. Um, you'll always find a way in the means, won't you? Yeah, exactly. If you, I, I'm a firm believer of, if you want to do it, you'll find a way. Um, yeah. And that, that, that's what anything in life. Be or you'll find a way not to do it. If you don't want to do it. Exactly. My dad always said, tell yourself you're right. Tell yourself you're wrong. Either way you're right. And, yeah. and he, he, he's right. You can, the brain's a powerful thing. And what you feed it, really does affect how it goes and, and, and the yeah. stuff, stuff like that is is you can either find a way of, of doing it or you can find a way of not doing it so i'm going to take you back to isle of Wight now from right. a story that you did tell me and it still tickles me so um danny the uh, airfield owner <laughs> is a colorful chap is he not he is indeed <laughs> um did you by any chance park on the taxiway at Spanfield. I, I tried to blame Paul for this, but I was in the left seat, so it's kind of my fault. Um, we were trying to get over to Paul Welsh. Uh, we were here for the Franglais. We'd arrived. It was quite busy. Uh, it was Spanfield and uh, the Eurostar flying all at once. Um, right. So there's aircraft everywhere. And on, on this taxiway, so you're coming, coming off the room, there's a taxiway heading for a camping area. And we were like, oh, we'll go over there to the, to the camping area because uh, we can see Paul Welsh. So as for taxi, I hear on the radio, uh, Julian, you know, whatever the radio was, stop, stop, stop. So I thought there's something wrong. Stop, mags, boom. Comes over anyway. Dan's like, no, you can't go that way, blah, blah, blah. Now you're blocking the taxiway, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, sorry. Yeah, really sorry. But rather than let me move the aircraft, he switches from bollocking me to, have you seen my museum? And I'm like, sorry? Do you want to see my rocket? And I was like, <laughs> Jim Carrey moment. Dan? And he was like, do you, want, do you want to see my rocket? And I was like, I'm not quite sure how to answer this. And it's still, <laughs> actually, do you know what? The Isle of Wight sounds a bit suspect when Dan's shown his rocket and Rob Squire wants to go for a spit roast. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we ended up having a walk around this, this museum, which is very impressive. If you do get a chance to go, go and have a look, because I didn't realize that the British space program from the 60s and 50s was actually hosted on the Isle of Wight. And there's a lot right. of that in this museum, which, which Dan has brought to life. And he's now mm. got the rocket garden. So the rocket that he was showing us is now standing up in a garden. Um, a, red, a red tip rocket. With, with the red tip, yeah. Um, <laughs> Why, <laughs> um, well, yeah, while all this is going on, we haven't moved the airplane, the airplane is still sat in this taxiway. So, <laughs> what'd you do? I just went back in and asked him where he'd like me to put it after we'd have a look at the museum. Fair enough, and he enjoyed the museum visit. Yeah, yeah exactly. it just tickles me, it really does. 
Um, I've really got a couple of questions. I have another story I probably haven't told you. If we're staying on the thing of bollockins, back in 2014 when Game of Thrones was getting filmed in Northern Ireland, myself and a mate of mine had taken off. Um, <laughs> and uh, we had discovered where they were filming Game of Thrones and they were filming at this current time. And we were just circled and circled and circled um, and took pictures. And then my mate flew and while I took pictures, then I flew or she took pictures. And eventually, anyway, we, we went back to the airfield. And when we landed, my flight instructor was like, where have you two been? We were like, ah, oh, nowhere. Why? He's like, well, <laughs> why, why have I been told you're overflying Game of Thrones and annoying them while they're filming it? And I was like, eh, <laughs> uh, well, it wasn't us. <laughs> Best bollocking I've ever got. I can neither confirm or deny, and I have no recollection of that event. I'd like to point out as well, we were illegal. It was about 1,500 feet we were doing this. Yeah. I think I've still got the radar traces somewhere for you, mate. <laughs> so there's actually a special part of your life that um, that became quite famous a while ago, wasn't it, to do with Robbie? Yes. So Is there a bit of story behind that one? There is. Robbie, Robbie's my brother, and Robbie's got a uh, rare condition called Williams Syndrome. So Robbie's missing 26 genes from chromosome 7. He's got elf life features, gaps between the teeth. Um, he's short. He's physically, he'd be 11 this year, but he, he mentally he'd only be, be kind of five or six. Um, but he's only got one emotion. And that emotion is, is happiness. He doesn't know anything else other than happiness. And he's born into the right family where he doesn't even know there's anything wrong with him because everyone's a lunatic in our family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and one day I got this idea. Robbie had sat in airplanes and he'd been brought up around airplanes, same as myself. And one day I just got this wild idea about bringing Robbie for a flight. And I was getting ready to move to the UK um, for, yeah. for another airline. Um, I was getting ready to, 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 to move. And I was kind of trying to trying to put all my ducks in order and fly as much as I could and enjoy myself. And uh, so myself and my best mate Keen um, had come up with this plan to bring Robbie flying, but I always thought my dad was going to want to do it. So we went to my dad and dad was stuck into, I don't know, flog it or one of them programs that are on on a Wednesday afternoon. And um, I was like, dad, can I bring Robbie flying? Thinking he'd say no. And he was like, well, yeah, if he wants to go flying. I was like, oh, that, that was an answer I wasn't expecting. Right. OK. okay. So I rang current in aviation and was like, look, I want this is what I want to do. Uh, will you let me do it? And they were like, yeah, no, what is hire an airplane? I was like, cool. So. Very early Saturday morning. That was on a Wednesday. Very early Saturday morning. Uh, I was kicking Keen out of bed because um, Keen doesn't like early mornings. So I had to drag him out of bed, put him in the car and drive up to go and to the to the air, airfield. So about a three-hour drive. Robbie and all the guys, they did get up on their holidays for the weekend. Uh, so they yeah. were going to meet us there. So we got there anyway. It was a bit foggy. We sat on the ground. Decided I wanted to test it out. So I put Robbie in the airplane. Uh, got his booster seat out of the car so he could see out the window because everyone knows the C-42, it's got molded bucket seats and mm. um, if you're quite short, you can't actually see out the window. So Robbie had been five at the time, um, couldn't see out the window. So we got his booster seat, put him in, strapped him in. So like, right, that's okay. Um, waiting in mean, more, countless cups of tea later. Boom, blue skies, no wind. It's time to go. Lucky enough, my mate uh, Steve, um, who does a lot of wingsuit uh, proximity flying and flies microlights as well out current in aviation, uh, had also said that uh, he'll be there. So he turns up with his GoPro um, and, and the, the audio lead. So I was like, brilliant. Now, I wasn't expecting anything of, of this. And we, we got some really cool stuff and some great pictures. So to test Robbie out, Robbie's ears are very sensitive. And the last thing I wanted to do was, was hurt his ear. So I wanted to test it out. And I also didn't want to scare him because if we took off, it could be a minute to a minute and a half before I can reconfigure that airplane and land again. And for someone who's not enjoying it and who's scared, that is the longest minute and a minute and a half of their life. Mm. And I could like an hour, wouldn't it? Exactly. Um, and an hour of being scared isn't very fun. Um, so I really wanted to, to test him out. So we, we got him in, pressed the push to start, looked at him. And he smiled. Yeah, he had his headsets on. And he smiled. And I think one of the things as well that helped was he could hear himself through the headsets. He could hear me. Um, yeah. So that was fine. So I was like, right, okay. Uh, and because the aircraft had already been flown, all the T's and P's were in the green already. So I was like, right, okay, let's do a taxi down to the end of the runway. And then we'll do a full power taxi back up to see what you thought. So taxi down, he was all good. Mm -hmm. On the way back up, full power. And I got a whee through the headsets. I looked over <laughs> and he was big, big green on his face. So I was like, right, okay. So. Tried it again, again, a big wee. So I was like, brilliant. I was like, okay, thumbs up to the family. Let's go and do this. Let's, let's, let's go flying. Yeah. Um, so lined up. Uh, as I lined up, I said to him, right, Rob, do you want to go flying? He said, yeah. So sure. Gave each other a fist bump. Um, 
And then I announced that we were going flying. And it was at this moment, it hit me. I was like, Jesus, I'm bringing, bringing my five-year-old brother flying. Flying, yeah. And I put full power on, got to about got to about 150 feet. Uh, and I got, I, I said, Robbie, we're flying. He said, yeah, we're in the sky today. And I was like, yeah. So that was a big thing. We had a big cheer. I released yeah. the flaps. At that point, I kind of settled into it. Um, because it was, it's quite nerve wracking that if anything happens, that's my five year old brother and the, the pride and joy of the family sat beside me. Yeah. Um, and it, as well, dad was like, Oh, just make sure nothing happens because he got Robbie on board. I was like, Yeah, cheers, dad. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Nothing like a, a, a short, succinct brief. Don't yeah. screw up. <laughs> so we, we kind of flew, flew around Tandragi itself, um, had, had a bit of fun kind of brought him back in. Robbie was loving every minute of it. Steve got on the radio, asked Captain Robbie, was he on the radio? Robbie was absolutely loving it and trying to respond and everything. Uh, but he couldn't reach the pre PTT button on the right-hand side, so he couldn't talk to him, unfortunately. Um, so as we came back around to Tandragi, he picked up a long finals. Um, two of us, I don't think any of us are ready to land, but all good things must must come to an end. And yeah. Finish um, on a high. Exactly. So we, we lined up, um, put the flaps on, Kind of concentrating. It's a little bit of a thermic day, so the approach wasn't really going the way I wanted it to. I wasn't getting the heights right, so I was doing everything I could, side slipping to get it in and everything. You did look fairly focused in the video. Yeah, it was. It was kind of like, oh, that, usually you're focused anyway, and then you got Robbie's episode as well, which is which has added added that little bit of pressure of this needs to be nice. Um, but as as I come over side slipping, just kind of got down a bit more. Robbie's gone, Mikey. I said yes, Rob. We getting dinner today. Yeah, we'll get dinner with today, yeah. <laughs> Are we going to have dinner with Keen? Yeah, we'll have dinner with Keen. And Dad. And Dad, yeah. And you? And me, yeah. We'll have dinner together. And my sister got really annoyed because he didn't mention her. And um, <laughs> he went to dinner with all the lads. <laughs> but we, we had landed from, from this flight. And uh, it, we, we got pictures and, and stuff. And then I kind of... I put the pictures on Facebook. By the time I did the three and a half hour drive home with, with, with Keen, it was 400 odd likes in this picture. And I stayed up most of the night then to, uh, to edit it. And then I drove the half hour to work the next day. And uh, I put it on YouTube, put it on Facebook. And at this point, by the time I got to work in half an hour, it two and a half thousand views. Wow. Um, that just kept going up and up and up and up and up. And Cause it, was um, spy- it went viral that video, didn't it? It did. It, 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 it's just underneath 12 million views now. Yeah. Was it, did um, it go Lad Bible? Um, was it Lad Bible as well? Took it. Lad Bible, Aussie Man. Um, there's a couple of others. You know, you made it when Aussie Man's. Ex- yeah, <laughs> and I didn't even realise what had happened. So it kind of all started with. I'd woken up from. Uh, I just woken up and I had all these texts saying congratulations, and we've seen the video, and I was like, "Why are you on about?" Them? There was one text from my cousin in Australia saying she saw us on the on the news, and I was like, "What? What's going on here?" So I flipped yeah. up my phone and opened Facebook, and it, it, it's just a torrent just of notifications. And Lad Bible have it, and it was just it was it was just going ballistic. And then I remember that that, that happened, and we we were celebrating something like two hundred thousand views at that point. We were like, "Oh wow, two hundred thousand views! Wow, that's so good! Wow!" And then. It just went from there, and and my, my stepma, who was who was a chef, made us cake that said celebrating two hundred thousand views, and like literally within that week, if it kept going up, we had about four cakes to celebrate because it, it just, <laughs> kept hitting different milestones. It was going well, and I remember one morning I got woken up by my phone ringing, and I was like, "Who is this?" And I was, "Oh, hello." And it's about half six in the morning, and um, I've literally just got woken up by this phone. I'm not with it at all, and it's a producer from the Anton Savage show in Ireland on Today FM. And they said, wow. uh, "Who? Uh, like, oh, would you would you be happy chatting to us about the flight?" And I was like, "Yeah, when?" And she was like, "Stand by." And next thing I knew, I'm live on the radio. And I'm like, I, "I've literally just woken up ten seconds ago, and now you're putting me live on the radio." I was like, uh, "And I, and you haven't had your coffee, and you do I, like a cup of coffee." Haven't had coffee. Love my coffee. Haven't I haven't even got I haven't even got dressed. <laughs> chatting on the I Anton Savage. I don't. I don't want to imagine what you were wearing. Yeah. <laughs> um, Manic. And that, yeah. that was it. And, and from there, then it, it just went mad. And there was newspapers and we were just national heroes. And we were we were ended up on, on um, TV three, which would be uh, the seven o'clock show, which would be uh, Ireland's answer to uh, this morning. Um, and then the pinnacle came when, when we were asked by Ryan Tuberty's team, who's quite big in, in Ireland, to go on the 
the biggest national radio uh, in, in Ireland to go and talk about it. And awesome. there was people wanting the rights to this video for advertisement issues and, and, and everything. And this, this, this was, it was, it was mad and completely out of my comfort zone. And Robbie just took it in a stride. Robbie didn't care as long as he attracted us to play with. It was, it was just, <laughs> it was, it was mad But for, for, as a flying perspective to put William syndrome and micro lighting on the map was an absolutely amazing yeah. thing. And one of the best things that I have come out of that was a letter from William syndrome to say, thank you so much. And it's gained so much traction. And from that, we ended up making contact with, um, other uh, families who, who have uh, kids diagnosed with Williams syndrome and weren't sure how to mm. cope with it. And I was able to put them in contact with my dad and my stepman, able to, to like, this is how you do it. As I, uh, that, that, it just sounds one of those stories that you, you couldn't imagine happening at all, really. No. Uh, and, and that passion feeds into everything that you do and say so a lot of our chats off, off, uh, off outside of this sort of scope, there's just so much passion and you are such a character <laughs> uh, which is kind of where this this uh, everything aviation podcast it is the epitome of you. Anything that's aviation, you're into. So that's kind of one of the sort of penultimate questions I've got. And so, w- where do you see your podcast going? Because you have interviewed some pretty epic celebrities, and I use the word carefully um, from around the world: America, Mike Ling from the the X Reds. Um, those people that own airfields, the, the whole raft of people, and and the pinnacle is obviously your dad, clearly. Um, in in, in that tell list them stuff of like that, I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously meeting people like Sam, and and it's just the whole aviation community from the light end through to the heavy end. It, it, it's all encompassed in your in your podcast. But where do you see it going in the future? Have you got plans for where you want to take it? Yeah, so it, it, I'll, I'll give you a base of how I actually started this podcast. And it was, it was something that came about during, during lockdown last year. I moved back to Ireland for a few months. And I'd always, I love podcasts. I love listening to people's stories. Um, and one day I was sat in the kitchen and I was listening to, it, it was a retired major Brian Shul about his uh, story um, flying through, uh, flying the, the, the SR-71 Blackbird as a training team. And listening to uh, California, I think I think it was LAX's uh, frequency, and people want speed readouts. And mm. oh, that's gave, brilliant story! It's it's a fantastic. He gave his speed readout of something like two thousand knots or something, and not a single error. Now, yeah, it's yeah. A, if you haven't listened to it, go on go on to YouTube, type in uh, Major Brian Shaw and have a listen to this. It's called the Speed Story, the LA Speed Story. LA Speed uh, Story, it's hilarious, it's fantastic. And I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking. Oh, I would love like to listen to more stories like this. And that's when it hit me. I was I'm a massive fan of Ross Kemp. I'm a massive fan of, of, of Jack Mate's podcast. Like podcasts in general, just I, I love and I listen to them. It's stories, it's people's life stories. And I thought, well, if I love listening to aviation stories, well, why don't I create a platform where I can listen or anyone can listen to these stories at any time? Mm. It's all in the one place. Pick a story, have a listen, move on to the next one. And this is where it kind of came about. So when I got back from Ireland, back to the UK, uh, the first thing I purchased was was a it, it wasn't anything like this. I did it with a with a dictaphone, where I would would balance it on the speakers of my laptop and through Facebook Messenger, I would video call someone and and have a chat with them like this and hope my dictaphone would would record yeah. the audio. And that that's how it kind of went about. I started interviewing mates of mine, like my my mate Keen, who I mentioned was the first person on the podcast, and then Rob Squire, who who quite a, a massive influence on my flying at the moment and is my best mate and uh, he came on it then and talked about it and we, we kind of went up in in the world from there but one day i was like oh i'm just getting my mates i really want to branch out a bit so one of my i wouldn't say one my, my hero in flying is mike ling um and for those of you who don't know mike ling mike ling is is the uh, war, uh the longest serving red arrows pilot in in history and uh, he also flies uh, a spitfire now and he's part of the blades aerobatic team and I wanted to chat to Mike, so I reached out. And if you haven't listened to that podcast, it's in Mike. <laughs> Go and have a listen because it's a re- it was a really really interesting podcast, uh, and and I I really enjoyed it. So so anyway, back to you. Come on. Um, it, it, it was just I reached out and was like, he's never ever gonna say this. I I was that kid who just got overexcited at air shows wanting to meet Mike Ling, um, and to, to my absolute amazement, Mike responded within the first day of emailing him and, and said, yeah, he'd, he'd be happy to, 
to listen to my podcast. And that was kind of my, or happy to, to speak to my podcast. And I was like, well, that's, that's one of the big things of breaking through here because I've now got someone who everyone knows and who's my, my hero and people might want to listen to this. And I was like, oh, I might be onto something here. Hmm. So I had, a, I had a chat with Mike and from chatting to Mike and all that, I kind of got the confidence to be like, right, well, I can talk. I could send anyone a message. So hmm. I've sent out tons of, of messages to people and, and 95% of them actually actually come back. And that's how this podcast has kind of come about. And we got some amazing um, guests in there as, as to say who've taken the time to talk to me and I'm genuinely interested in hearing their stories and that's where this has come like like Sam himself Sam's one was absolutely amazing when I read that I needed to I needed to interview Sam and if you yeah. haven't heard Sam's story if, if you're finding it difficult at the moment and you're in the, any kind of aviation industry you have to have a listen to this story because Sam's thing will just he's been through everything isn't he yeah he definitely yeah. He did a, yeah Sam could take anything on now um, and then kind of I don't think it's been officially announced yet, but so I'll do it here instead. But Touchdown Radio uh, UK, who are the UK's first aviation only radio, we're looking for radio presenters. And I was like, well, I've done the podcast. Why not? Um, <laughs> so I, I sent in an application. Unfortunately enough, they've, they've taken me on and I'm starting very soon with them. So I'm a Touchdown Sweet. radio presenter now. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of where I want to take the podcast is onto the radio. Um and kind of get new ideas for it there and, yeah. and, and watch it grow. And um, I don't care if it wins awards uh, and I don't care. Like it, it, it's got quite high in at the moment. It's got, it's got quite high in, in uh, we've made it into the top 10 in, in, in Australia. We've made it into the top 10 in New Zealand. We were number two in Ireland at one stage. We were in the top 10 in the UK. Um, and is that just on, uh, on streams? That, that's just on streams. Um, wow. Yeah. And, it, all from it, all from a crazy idea. All from an idea of me wanting to hear other people's stories and people wanting, possibly people wanting to hear stories also. Yeah, and and that's kind of where my, my idea with this was like, well, you want to hear other people's stories, but actually your story is just as interesting. And I thought it's where we're going to turn the tables on it. Well, this is uh, where I kind of agreed to it because. You know, yeah. you listen to the, the Kemp cast, which is done by Ross Kemp. Everyone knows about Ross Kemp. And you listen to, to like, Jack May. Jack May's had a massive YouTube following, and he, he's a YouTuber and everything like that. And then little old me comes along, and nobody knows anything about me. And all of a sudden, there's this weird Irish guy doing a podcast, chatting to some of the biggest names in aviation. And it always kind of struck me as if, would it be better if people had an idea about what I did um, mm. and what, what my story is? Um so and now we know. And now you know. <laughs> yeah. All about half a chicken in your aircraft. <laughs> and having a spit roast in the Isle of Wight in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, it's all your fault. <laughs> I'm sure he's cowering in the background there somewhere. He is, yeah. He's, he's, he's gone very quiet and very red. My last question is, um, is that part of, it's taking on your passion of flying. And, and clearly today, even today, you've just released a video of you flying the Spitfire simulator at Goodwood, which looks amazing. I might have to save my pennies and, and drag myself down there and have a go. But where do you see your flying going in the future, really? So this is sort of bringing, bringing your podcast to a close. We've gone from your childhood, your embarrassed BBC documentaries, uh, your midlife crisis, as it were. Uh, but where do, you, where do you want to take your flying in the future? I'd, I'd love to, like I said, I'd love to get the instructor sign off for the H320. Um, yeah. That's what I'm kind of working, working uh, to now. Uh, with Alpha Tech, and yeah. then um, I'd love to get. I think my next kind of step is is to do the BMAA strip skills course, which is getting in and out of uh, farm strips and soft ground. Yeah. Um, and then you need it. a PB for that. It's really easy. <laughs> An AX tree will do as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I would like to do the tailwheel stuff, and then go on to do the instructor's course. Um, doing it that way and every, everyone kind of and it, it annoys me like it doesn't really annoy me it's just i find there's this superiorness that ga think they have over microlights um because mm -hmm. every time i mention i want to be a microlight instructor now fair i've got a few mates who have said do, do what you want to do but there's a few few people down like my um flying clubs and stuff like that who've, who've said oh go up to the a class you can do all that blah, blah, blah. yeah you can you can do lots more and i could probably end up flying a spitfire if i did that but it's all about the money and I'm, I'm happy doing what I do. I'm having way too much fun doing what I do now where C42 would outfly a 152 any day or a 172 any day. Um, 
and and that's that's just where I'm I'm happy with what it is yeah. now. I'll I'll have my H320 instructors rating in the bag, uh, in the back pocket. That'll do me for uh, for work, and um, we'll we'll just have fun and, and instruct on uh, for for fun on on the micro lights afterwards. And I think that's as far as I I really want to go now. If anyone offered me, if someone came to me tomorrow and said, "You, I want you to fly my Spitfire or fly my Harvard, uh, any kind of warbird, really." But you need to do the light. I'd go and do it in a heartbeat. But mm. that's so rare to do that. I just, I'm, I'm happy doing what I do, and that's where I want to take my flying. I want to, I want to compete more. I want, I want to do more competitions. I want to do, um, it's a sport you can't complete. And I want to do my instructor rate. And I want to teach. You never stop to... learning, do you? You never ever stop learning. No, never. And the day you do is the day you should stop because that's when you become dangerous. I exact. Um, I say exactly the same thing. Yeah. In, 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 but yeah, that that's where I want to go with this. I want to teach people my passion. I want to be able to bring people into this world and show them how I feel and what I see, and um, and that that's kind of what I, what I want to do with it. Well, I've I've kind of run out of questions to ask you, really. So that kind of brings your podcast to a close. Um, as you said, we never stop learning. And for those that have been watching this podcast, I hope you've learned a bit more about your natural host for this podcast, Mikey McFadden. Thank you very much. <laughs> I nearly got it right there as well. Nearly, nearly. <laughs> nearly. <laughs> One of these days, mate. One of these days. <laughs> we'll let you off with it. <laughs> but anyway, so um, so that closes your podcast. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And as I said, I hope you learned a bit more about Mikey, your host. Thank you very much for listening, guys. <laughs>